I'm Ros Atkins, welcome to Outside Source. It's an hour of international news through the Outside Source screen. We can access all the latest information coming through the BBC newsroom. And the pressure of the migrant crisis is taking its toll on Sweden. It's taken thousands of people in in the last few months, but now it's introducing border controls to try and stop the flow. We don't have a welfare system that can support the migrants. We don't have any housing. Here's a statistic for you. One website in China took over a billion dollars in eight minutes earlier. It's Singles Day, aka the biggest online shopping event of the year. Syria's army has made significant gains with the help of Russian airstrikes. Steve Rosenberg is at the Russian airbase where those missions begin. Russian bombers have been taking off from here. They've been locating targets and carrying out airstrikes across Syria. These are incredible pictures that have been released today from Alaska of a skier falling and falling and falling down the side of the mountain. We'll play you that in OS Sport. Um, he was OK, by the way. And while we're live here on BBC Television, we're also open for business online as well, of course. If you use the hashtag BBCOS, I'll pick up all of your messages. Now, there's a major summit on the migrant crisis taking place in Malta. We'll update you on that in a couple of minutes. But if you wanted more evidence of the pressure that this crisis is applying, just have a look at this from Sweden. Here's some uh, copy that I can pull up from the BBC World Service newsroom telling us that Sweden is imposing temporary border checks. Now, this is significant because Sweden is part of Europe's free trade, uh, free movement zone. Also highlight the fact that Swedish police are saying it's now becoming a matter of public order. And we talk a lot about Germany in the context of the migrant crisis, and it's taken in thousands. But in fact, Sweden takes in more migrants per capita than any other European country. Let's learn more about this from our Europe editor, Katja Adler. Misty, moody Stockholm nicknamed the Venice of the North, is shrouded in promise for those looking for a better life in Europe. There are more asylum seekers per capita here than in any other European country. Search the word asylum in Arabic on your smartphone and Sweden pops up as a number one result. This is Masha Detention Center, north of the Swedish capital. We were given rare access to film here. <coughs> Sweden is famous for its open door policy to refugees and for handing them generous benefits. But the recent mass arrival of asylum seekers is forcing Sweden to face uncomfortable decisions about the society it wants and can afford to be. <laughs> Most migrants here face imminent deportation. Many are from Africa. Radouan is Moroccan, a self-confessed economic migrant. He didn't apply for asylum. His deportation case is clear-cut for the Swedish authorities. Yeah, yeah. But Musa, from Nigeria, says deportation will kill him. Boko Haram murdered the rest of his family, he told me, so he'll try to come back to Europe again, despite the dangerous journey. I can do it again and again, because I can never give up and I can never go there. It will be like going back to hell. This is Husby suburb just outside Stockholm. Most families here aren't Swedish born. To be told you can't stay is devastating for people claiming asylum. But many Swedes, many Europeans are panicking as well at the numbers of those arriving here. 
Their leaders are desperate to appear in control, and Europe has been promising a whole raft of measures, including speeding up deportation. But we found no evidence of that at all. In fact, a large proportion of failed asylum seekers, 50% here in Sweden, just disappear under the radar. They live with friends and family who live here legally. The anti-immigration Sweden Democrats party is increasingly popular here. Jenny and Per recently started working for them. They say Sweden can't cope, that the country is full. It is full. We don't have a welfare system that can support the migrants. We don't have any housing. And I think more and more people are realizing that this is not a, it's not feasible to take so many immigrants during a so, so short time period. Sweden's government is under political, economic and moral pressure. It's asked the EU for help. We cannot just throw women and children back into the war. That's a moral obligation for us. The rest of Europe has to help. I mean, we cannot be the, 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 the one country that year after year after year is doing more than any other country. The United Kingdom has to help. Trains carrying migrants to Sweden keep coming, all day, every day. While Europe's leaders argue about responsibility, these families could spend the icy Swedish winter in tents. Katja Adler, BBC News, Stockholm. Well, Katja was referring there to arguments, discussions between European leaders, and those very discussions are taking place a long way from Sweden in Malta, right in the middle of the Mediterranean. They're not just there on their own, they're meeting African leaders because while much attention has understandably been paid to Syrians and Iraqis heading to the European Union, this time the focus is on Africa. And people are making this journey from Africa into Europe for quite different reasons. So we went to find BBC World Service colleagues who could help us explain that. Some people may be fleeing war or persecution, but if you take a country like Ghana, Ivory Coast or Senegal, I don't think that the people will be going to Europe begging for food. They will be going to Europe looking for work, for something to do. In East Africa, there's uh, many different reasons why people are traveling or immigrating to Europe. For example, Eritreans and, uh, talk about repressive regime, and lack of human rights, and lack of opportunity, and in Somalia, you know Somalia is also suffering from the Al-Shabaab violence and lack of stable government. Uh, thousands of the migrants, illegal migrants, uh, choose to go through Libya to Europe because there's no government, there's no law, uh, the, uh, and it's a huge border so they can't, they can't uh, cross illegally into the country and uh, from two routes, uh, mainly from Niger to Libya or from Algeria to Libya, and then they go to the coast, the Mediterranean coast, to Zwara city, which is very close to the Italian islands. They need six to eight hours to, to arrive to, this, uh, to this, these islands. And uh, it's not a secret that in Zwara city, there is a huge or very, very big illegal network uh, uh, of smugglers. Uh, they usually paid from 500 to 1,000 for this trip. And within a few hours, they would be in Europe. And uh, we've been keeping a close eye on this summit in Malta. No significant developments, but there is a, a major emphasis from the European leaders on trying to persuade people coming from Africa to not make, not make that journey in the first place. And the talks with African governments are very much about how to do that. OK, let's switch from that story to Syria, because uh, I want to show you these pictures that have emerged today. They show us uh, Syrian forces fighting Islamic State at a very important military airbase near Aleppo. Aleppo is one of the biggest cities in Syria. The Syrian army eventually took this base back from IS after a two-year-long siege. And, well, that's significant in its own right, but more so because it's the first significant gain since the Russians started supporting the Syrian military from the air. Well, I can show you exactly where this air base is um, on the map here on the outside source screen, just to the east of Aleppo, as I was mentioning. And many of these Russian airstrikes uh, are launched from planes that will take off at an air base close to a city called Latakia. And the BBC Steve Rosenberg has been given access to the base. Here's his report. Around Latakia, there is one sound you hear all day and all night.
Russia's air campaign in Syria is non-stop. And today, Russia's military gave us rare access to its base. They showed us how they load the ammunition for airstrikes. This 500 kilogram bomb, we were told, will target terrorists. When it launched its air campaign in Syria, Russia said this would be a limited operation, that it wouldn't allow itself to be dragged into a prolonged conflict. Well, after six weeks of airstrikes, there's no end in sight. Russia continues to wage what it calls a war on international terrorism. But Russia has come in for criticism from the West over some of the targets it's been hitting and over claims that some of Russia's airstrikes have caused civilian casualties. Today, a Russian major general told me there was no evidence for that. Russia, he said, was using precision weapons and targeting terrorists. Russia concedes that only international talks can bring peace to Syria, the power of diplomacy. For now, though, it's Russian air power which is making itself felt. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, at the Russian air base in Syria. OK, from Syria to Myanmar, because we are close to the most remarkable of stories, but we're not there yet. We know that Aung San Suu Kyi and her party, the NLD, have done very well in the weekend's election. In fact, the latest news is that the spokesperson for the president says he wants to congratulate the party on its success. And if you look at some of these pictures that have come in from Myanmar, you can see the newspaper stalls uh, showing uh, one person far more than anyone else on the front page. But the official results are not in yet. And until they arrive, and until we can be sure that the military won't intervene, as it did last time Aung San Suu Kyi won in 1990, we won't know for sure that her party is going to assume power. But one thing I'll mention, bear in mind, the president is backed by the military. So if he's offering his congratulations, the signs are the result will be respected. But until we get that confirmed, we can't be sure. Well, uh, a few hours ago, we spotted there was a huge protest going on in Afghanistan. Uh, we know it's a response to the killing of seven people from the Hazara ethnic minority. Um, let me show you exactly where this happened, a long way from Kabul, in fact, uh, to the southwest, Zabul province. And the protesters believe either Islamic State or the Taliban carried out the attack. To uh, get some help reporting this story, we asked Sia Sharia from BBC Afghan Service to pass by and fill us in. The government forces have been also involved uh, in the region, so uh, fighting was going on in the region, and then we had the news of uh, these hostages being uh, beheaded, and uh, they were uh, kidnapped uh, a few months ago, and uh, there was no clear news about their fate. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, still a lot of ambiguity uh, around it. And tell us about the ethnic group from which the victims came, because lots of our viewers may not know this group. Yeah, they're uh, Hazara, uh, minority in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, historically, they've been uh, prejudiced and uh, they've suffered a lot of uh, problems in uh, mm. Afghanistan. They live in central Afghanistan. Uh, they are uh, very close to also southern province of Afghanistan where Taliban and uh, some ISIS mm -hmm. cells have influence and uh, so during these uh, 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 travels and trips that they've got from different provinces uh, they are complaining that they've been stopped on the way they've been taken hostages by the Taliban and also, uh, as well as by ISIS I've just fighters. been watching the pictures there's a big big turnout at this protest apart from grieving for those who are lost what do they actually want the government to do about well, yeah, thousands of people, they're talking about uh, 20 to 25,000 people poured into streets of Kabul today. They surrounded the Afghan presidential palace and they were uh, calling slogans against uh, President Ashraf Ghani, CEO mm -hmm. Dr. Abdullah. And uh, they are asking for tightening security in their uh, regions. They are asking for uh, the proper ceremony for these uh, seven uh, uh, beheaded people, including one nine-year-old uh, child. And you can find out about all the BBC World Services language services through bbcworldservice.com. Now in about uh, three, four minutes' time, it's going to be OS Business. Uh, we've got this report for you about how bespoke adverts are being inserted into TV programmes and films. That's from David Silito. We'll play the full report in a few minutes.
you've got a secret. Something you can't tell anyone. Because you don't trust anyone. Ah, 007. One last thing for you. Does it do anything? It tells the time. I'm Ross Atkins with Outside Source. We're live here in the BBC Newsroom. Our lead story is that Sweden is the latest European country to introduce border controls to try and stem the flow of migrants into the country. Let's bring you some of the main stories from BBC World Service. First of all, eight policemen in South Africa have been jailed for the murder of a taxi driver from Mozambique in 2013. You might remember the horrific video of this. The man was handcuffed to a police van and then dragged through the streets. It was filmed by a person who happened to be there. That video was crucial in leading to the convictions. Russia has confirmed the authenticity of the remains of the country's last Tsar and his wife. They were killed by Bolsheviks in 1918. The Russian Orthodox Church wanted to be certain that these bones were authentic before it now goes ahead and buries them beside the rest of the Romanov family in St. Petersburg. And lots of you have been watching this video on the BBC News app. This guy cuts open the roof of a Porsche in central London in daylight, climbs in through the roof, tries to drive away, doesn't go so far. Not long later, he simply climbs out of the roof and walks away. Okay, time for OS business, and this story well, it comes around every year, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. It's Singles Day in China. It's the world's biggest online shopping event, and whenever we report on this, we're always talking about Alibaba. Lots of you will know it. It's a vast website, and it's broken its own sales records. It took over $1 billion within eight minutes of the start of the sale. Well, Celia Hatton has been talking to people in Beijing who are hunting for a bargain or two. Many people in China have been joking that they need to cut off their own hands in order to stop themselves from spending so much money online. And this spending that's gone on. Alibaba, the world's biggest online shopping platform, says that more than $5 billion worth of merchandise was purchased within the first 90 minutes of the Singles Day sale. But don't mistake the rush to spend on Singles Day as a sign the Chinese economy is turning around. It's common for people to wait to spend on Singles Day in order to save money. New data underlines continuing concerns about the slowdown in the Chinese economy. Inflation was down last month, indicating that consumption is also falling. And that's a long-term trend that a Singles Day sale won't fix. Celia Hatton, BBC News, Beijing. And of course you're watching that and you're thinking there are probably a few online businesses outside of China who'd like a piece of this action. Let's bring in a, a Neda Torfik live from uh, New York. I mean, you know, Amazon and others spring to mind. They must be wanting to have a singles day of their own, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely, Roz. I mean, when you look at, for example, Cyber Monday, which I guess you could say is kind of the equivalent here in the United States, last year they had just over a billion in sales. Compare that with today, over 14 billion in sales from Singles Day. Uh, so definitely U.S. retailers are trying to cash in on this. You have, for example, Macy's, Costco, Lego, uh, even Mars Candy Bars uh, trying to get in on the action using Alibaba's T-Mall to interact with Chinese consumers, that middle class who are really growing and really trying to to you know, branch out and hit some targeted brands. And so that's why U.S. retailers are going after that. You have had Alibaba's CEO, Daniel Zhang, say that 27 million Chinese consumers have bought international brands. So there's clearly a demand there. Uh, and that's why over 5,000 brands in over 25 countries have participated. And if you look at it, I mean, some of the kind of retailers here in the U.S., for example, the kind of brick and mortar stores are really struggling because of online competition. So it's really the smart thing to do for these retailers to go after things like single day and the overall big e-commerce market to try to get more dollars from those consumers. And Nettie, you dropped us a note uh, a couple of minutes ago saying you wanted to talk about Macy's, very well-known department store. It's having some problems. 
Yeah, that's right. Macy's basically had their earnings out today. They're down 5% this last quarter from the previous years, and they've actually downgraded their forecast 10% for the coming year. And that's, again, because they're dealing with the e-commerce market, so not as many consumers coming in. They're also being hurt by the strong dollar. Tourists aren't coming in and spending as much because they're not getting as much of an exchange rate. Uh, so Macy's is really having to, you know, turn around their business plan. They're having to close about 35 to 40 stores in the United States and really cut down on costs to try to get consumers in. Uh, the other thing, Roz, is we've been having such great weather here in the United States, really unseasonably warm weather, uh, that people aren't really buying those kind of winter essentials like coats and boots, so that affected the retailer. But again, as I said, the overall big picture is getting into the mobile uh, and online market. Neda, thank you very much indeed. Well, while I was talking to Neda, uh, the screen packed up, so we'll fix that. We'll turn it on, turn it off again. It should start working. In the meantime, let me play you uh, this report from David Silito on advertising and how it's becoming a bit more sophisticated in TV and film. There, on the right, the poster. It's an ad. Now watch this bottle. And this fridge. On the left, the original. On the right, the beer bottle has been added digitally. And how about this? Yes, the car isn't what it appears. This is the new frontier, digital product placement. And if you watch online, the products can be changed to reflect the audience. And of course, it means that you can change things according to where you happen to be watching. If your character develops a bit of a thirst, what they drink can change if they're in Singapore, Indonesia, China, or here, back to Britain. The products can also shift depending on who's watching to reflect your sex, your age, or even your income. Give me an idea, what could you do with a space like this? Well, a guiding principle around what we do is finding the right, right brand for the right context. And in this sort of context, we could do a number of things. We could have beverages, we could have computers, or we could have mobile phones. Uh, and we can even reinforce those brand messages by having signage, for example, um, which reflects the same brand, uh, but albeit in a different way. All I'm saying is I'm like the brain man of the surf. Yeah, how's that? It's already being used. Yes, that film poster on Home and Away is digital and different in different parts of the world. Yuku, a sort of Chinese YouTube and Netflix, has just signed a deal to use the technology in its programs. The appeal? It's a solution to the great fear running through advertising that we're getting better and better at avoiding ads. But when they're in the program, you really can't skip. The car on the left, by the way, and the billboard aren't real. They're ads. David Silito, BBC News. Very interesting. More hours business tomorrow. Now, Narendra Modi, Indian Prime Minister, is due to arrive in the UK uh, on Wednesday to discuss increasing investment and trade links between Britain and India. Here's our business editor, Kamal Ahmed, on why he's been doing so much travelling. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, loves to travel. He's clocked up a remarkable 27 trips since becoming leader last year. From Australia to Tajikistan, he's a true jet setter. Mr Modi wants to prove that India is open for business. He wants to sell India around the world. Maybe he just likes ticking off a few of the top tourist destinations. Well, that's what the critics back home have said but he sees his travels as an essential part of building bridges. And as you can see, he's not afraid to embrace local culture. But with India's growing economic power, world leaders are keen to see him. Just before this boat trip, he sealed a deal with France for fighter jets. India certainly got money to spend. Look at the multi-billion dollar deal it's just done for fighter jets. And also, it's got a huge and growing middle class. By 2020, it will have the most middle class people in the world, and they will buy a lot of stuff. 
and despite a rivalry with China to become an economic superpower, he's tried to make connections there as well. China and India are the world's biggest nations, but India's always felt a bit of a poorer cousin, and Prime Minister Modi wants to change that. India is the ninth largest economy in the world at the moment. The IMF predicts that within a decade, it could be the third largest. Modi wants to make sure that India is on a par with China when you're thinking about foreign investment. And let's not forget, he's incredibly popular with the Indian diaspora. Prime Minister Modi has certainly revealed himself as something of a showman. He loves the big ticket event. In London, he's hired the biggest stadium for a huge event involving all the Indian diaspora who live in Britain. And of course, we'll be covering his visit to the UK here on the BBC. Speak to you in a couple of minutes. Well, people who know more about these things than me are still tinkering with our screen. In the meantime, we'll continue to bring you the latest uh, international news here on Outside Source. Last night we were previewing the latest Republican presidential debate. Uh, now we can look over how the candidates fared. By all accounts, we've got more detail from all of them uh, than we had done previously, particularly on foreign policy. If you missed it, here's some of the action. We'll have a wall, the wall will be built, the wall will be successful, and if you think walls don't work, all you have to do is ask Israel. The wall works, believe me, properly done, believe me. But for the 11 million people, come on folks, we all know you can't pick them up and ship them across, back across the border. It's a silly argument. It's not an adult argument. It makes no all sense. Can... Even having this conversation sends a powerful signal. They're doing high fives in the Clinton campaign right now when they hear this. There are radical jihadists in the Middle East beheading people and crucifying Christians. A radical Shia cleric in Iran trying to get a nuclear weapon. The Chinese taking over the South China Sea. Yes, I believe the world is a safer... No, no, I don't believe. I know that the world is a safer and better place when America is the strongest military power on the, in the world. I think in order to make them look like losers, we have to destroy their caliphate. I've never met Vladimir Putin, but I know enough about him to know he's a gangster. If Putin wants to go and knock the hell out of ISIS, I am all for it, 100%. It is tragic that you see Iraq and other countries now talking to Russia. Look at Libya, look at Iraq, look at the mess we have after spending $2 trillion, thousands of lives, wounded warriors all over the place who I love. Okay, all over. We have nothing. Let's bring in outside source regular Anthony Zerka, live with us from Washington, D.C., uh, watching over these things very closely for us. So how did you score it? Uh, well, I think it was a relatively restrained debate. I mean, uh, even Donald Trump, he was asked serious questions, and he gave serious answers that were taken seriously. But I think the big stars, again, for the second debate in a row, Marco Rubio, constantly on message, constantly turning everything back to his stump speech, and Ted Cruz, who he was a college debater, a star college debater, and it showed again uh, on immigration and on uh, a sparring with John Kasich over big bank bailouts. And in terms of Rubio, did he get into immigration? He's previously wanted to talk about that a lot, hasn't he? <laughs> well, he was one of uh, the gang of eight of senators who were pushing for immigration reform uh, a number of years back, uh, but he sidestepped it. He's not really liked by the base on the immigration issue. They don't trust him. So he kind of took a hands-off position when everyone else, Donald Trump and Jeb Bush and John Kasich and Ted Cruz, were going back and forth on it. He probably was a big winner on that topic just by not being a part of it. And tell me how this works, Anthony. At the moment, we have front runners, people lagging a little behind. Can it all completely shift around once we hit the primaries, or have we got a decent guide to how it might pan out? 
Well, you know, you never know until people actually turn out and vote. There have been a lot of cases in the past where people look really good in polls, but their on the ground get out the vote drive just doesn't show up and they crumble. So uh, we think we know what's going on right now, but until people start turning out in uh, the schools in Iowa and casting their ballots and caucusing, we don't really know. All right, Anthony, thank you very much indeed. We're going to be talking about this for, well, about 12 months, because uh, this is going to go on for some uh, time. Uh, in the meantime, though, let's turn away from American politics, bring you up to date on a few of the big global sports stories. We'll start uh, with an update on Seth Blatter. We're told he's had a small emotional breakdown. Not my words, the words of his lawyer. Uh, remember, he's suspended from FIFA while a corruption investigation continues. As always, Richard Conway is uh, plugged directly into stories related to FIFA. Here's a tweet from Richard saying, sources close to Blatter say he's adamant no committee can put me out of the game. The health issue is described as a small breakdown. We're also told by his lawyer that he will be out of hospital soon. Now, let's turn to rugby. Big, big story from English rugby. Not really a big surprise, though. Stuart Lancaster has quit as the English rugby coach. Um, and as he finally is joining us from the BBC Sports Centre, I mean, I guess there weren't too many places to go after that World Cup. No, Roz, ultimately he paid the price for that World Cup. England, remember, the first ever home nation to go out at the pool stages. Now, Lancaster said that he agreed uh, to step down. He said he ultimately took responsibility uh, for the team's performance. Now, Lancaster, remember, he was made the permanent coach in 2012. He's won 28 of 46 games but failed to win the Six Nations and as we mentioned, uh, had a disastrous World Cup with England. Now, there was a review following that World Cup into the failings. It was a five-man panel. They spoke to uh, various people. The RFU chief executive, Ian Ritchie, also spoke to people aside from um, privately. They said that every member of the squad had an opportunity to give feedback, every member of the coaching and management team. Interestingly, they said not everybody wanted him to go, uh, but the RFU has said they're now looking for a head coach with international experience. They haven't ruled out a foreign coach, but they did deny making contact with the Australia coach, Michael Checker, or anyone else uh, for that matter. But they said that they will take their time to find the perfect replacement. As you thank you. It's interesting, isn't it? They say they wanted a, uh, they want a coach with international experience. That was precisely what Stuart Lancaster didn't have, and they gave him the job. Anyway, there we go. We'll find out in due time who, uh, due course, who's going to take over from Stuart Lancaster. Right. Let's turn to athletics. We've been doing this all week. Russia has been right at the centre of attention because of that doping report that came out on Monday. Well, Vladimir Putin has been speaking about all of this for the first time. Let me show you uh, some of the quotes that have come out. He says he wants to carry out our own internal investigation and ensure the most open professional cooperation with international uh, anti-doping structures. He goes on to say Russia must do everything to get rid of this problem and this is not only a Russian problem. Well, that last point is interesting because another country mentioned in the report, albeit in far, far less detail, is Kenya. And Ansoy has been talking to Kip Kano, as you may know, he's a real giant of Kenyan athletics, a double Olympic champion. And he's now chairman of Kenya's Olympic Committee. Here he is, talking to Anne. Kenya and Jamaica and Russia were mentioned. But I came back home, I told the minister, we have a problem. You need to communicate with World Anti-Doping. And we rectify all these things to be able not to be on the leading list in the world. Uh, instead of the minister taking action, he took it very lightly. We've only started hearing about this problem in the last two, three years. What has changed? We didn't have any side things. But we have allowed people to come in from other countries as coaches, as managers, to manage our people. And their duty is they want money. They want to gain, they want to get money out of our own people. This is a problem we are facing. So what's the way forward in your opinion? The agent and that man who is giving drugs. So those are the people responsible, should be taken care of. Action should be taken immediately, like what is happening, has happened in Jamaica. Jamaica cleaned their own house. Russia, they are now cleaning their house. So we need to clean ours now, not tomorrow, not next year, now. 
Now, have you seen this on the BBC Sport website? Uh, not a headline that's likely to be repeated. Police investigate NFL player Ray Ray Armstrong for barking at a dog. This is perfectly true. Uh, if you don't believe me, have a look at this next report. So there you go, that's astonishing. So is this next video I've got to show you. Have a look at this. This is a man called Ian McIntosh making a sport film uh, while skiing in Alaska. And as you can see, he very early on loses control and falls and then just continues to fall for a very, very long time. 500 meters almost. And all the while, his filming kit uh, continued to record the sound. So you actually hear what he's going through. I'll stop talking and you can listen. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. And those are the words that I expect his colleagues and family were very glad to hear. Uh, I'm sure he was uh, glad he was able to utter them. He was fine. What a remarkable video. You can see it on the BBC News app right now. Now, in a couple of minutes' time, I've got a uh, report to play you about the first British astronaut to go to the International Space Station. And he's, he's, in, he's doing his final preparations in Russia. We'll have a report from where he's training. Let me just update you on our lead story here in the BBC newsroom at the moment. It concerns the migrant crisis. Sweden is the latest European country to introduce border control. Swedish police are saying there's a public order issue and the government wants to control the number of migrants coming into the country. And after outside source, well, what you've got depends on where you're watching. If you're outside the UK, it's World News America. That's got a, a report linked to Armistice Day in Europe and Veterans Day in the US. It's about the growing unease amongst US veterans about being labelled as heroes when they return from service. And here in the UK, it's the news at 10 with Hugh Edwards. Hugh's got the latest unemployment figures. The jobless rate has fallen to its lowest level in seven years. Now, as I was mentioning, the first British astronaut to visit the International Space Station will be taking off very soon. He's called Tim Peake. He's a former Army Major, and he's doing his final preparations in Russia. David Shukman went to see him. The big day is getting very close, and Tim Peake and two colleagues face the last practice before liftoff. In a simulator of the spacecraft they'll fly in, they sit for three cramped, gruelling hours as their instructors test them with a series of emergencies, a leak, an engine failure. And when it ended, Tim Peake emerged looking tired, but pleased. Tim, how was it in there? It was good, yeah. It was, uh, we had the descent, we had a number of malfunctions. Uh, but I think we cope with all the malfunctions pretty well, and uh, ultimately we got down all safe. So uh, we'll go and have a debrief now and find out how it all went. Tim Peake's journey into space began as a cadet in West Sussex. He was keen on flying and became an army helicopter pilot, serving in Afghanistan, then being selected for a mission up to the International Space Station, the first Briton to go there. This is a mock-up of part of the International Space Station, and it gives you a sense of the incredible scale of this great structure that's been in orbit above Earth for the last 15 years. Let's take a look inside. Now, this is one of the Russian 
modules. And if I show you here, you can see how these different modules all connect together to form the space station. But this one acts as the focal point. Around this table, every evening, that's where Tim Peake and the five other astronauts are going to be gathering. To get this far has taken six years of training, including working underwater to get ready for a possible spacewalk. It's a chance to fulfill a childhood dream. Could you ever have imagined being on the brink of going into space? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, was, I got into aviation at an early, early age and I was really focused on that and passionate about it, but I'd never imagined at all that I'd be here only five weeks away from a launch to space. And how does it feel? It feels absolutely wonderful. So, next stop, the launch pad for a spectacular trek into space. And the date set is December the 15th. The duration of the mission, six months. David Truckman, BBC News, at Star City near Moscow. What an interesting report. Remember, all these longer reports we run on Outside Source, you can also find online, either through the BBC News app or the BBC News website. Now, let's um, go back to Myanmar. We were talking about it earlier. It's on the brink of an extraordinary moment. Aung San Suu Kyi is claiming victory in the election. We've heard from uh, the president's spokesperson, who says he's looking to extend his congratulations to her NLD party. That's the National League for Democracy. But we're still having to add lots of caveats because the election commission has not released the official results and it's a big leap to gain power. The military controls a quarter of parliament. That means Aung San Suu Kyi and her colleagues need to take around two-thirds of the vote to get a simple majority. We still wait to see if she's done that, though the indications are she has. Let's get the reaction of a few residents in Yangon. If the NLD runs the government, we expect to have a better economy, better health services, better education, and a better rule of law than the one we have now. I'd like to see the education system developing and becoming more modern. Also, I'd like to see much better job opportunities and a better life for all the people. If the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi run the country, I hope life will improve for us hawkers. She said she would organise things better for us. We'll keep you posted on that story. Now, as I was mentioning, veterans in America and the UK are being recognised today for their military service in speeches and parades across both countries. And in the US, some veterans are a little uncomfortable with the attention. Here's a report from the BBC's David Botti on why that is. I had a f close friend. They, we had children exactly the same age. We knew each other for about eight or ten years. Sleepovers with the kids overnight and everything. And one evening the wives were talking and realized that their husbands had both been Marines in Vietnam. That was the atmosphere back then. You never said, you never talked about being in the Vietnam War. I think to the country's credit, they don't do that anymore. The pendulum may have swung just too far. In other words, it's like now everybody's a hero instead of a villain. Uh, it's like that's not true either. Over the past few years, more and more veterans have been pushing back on being called heroes. They worry the word is becoming devalued, that it takes away from true heroes, that it obscures real issues that need to be addressed. Many veterans um, of our generation really balk at the term hero and, and, and push back, saying, no, I was just doing my job. I think it's really important that veterans, uh, we make this messy. We make those conversations messy um, and, and complicated and nuanced because that's, how, that's what people are. Last year, there was a big survey of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. 42% said they didn't think civilian respect for the military was genuine. About 70% said they often felt misunderstood. But almost the same number also said they felt appreciated. So that's what makes this all so complex. History shows that leveraging... American Congressman Seth Moulton is from Massachusetts. He served as a Marine in Iraq and was decorated for valor in combat. Do people call you hero? I mean, some people do, um, but it always makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't like it. Why do you think it's a bigger deal to civilians? I think that a lot of Americans who don't have a real connection to the troops are, are looking for something to grasp onto, something to celebrate. Frankly, we don't need that as veterans. We don't need parades and celebrations. We need people to give us an opportunity when we come home. Many veterans worry they're being pushed into one of two categories, either the hero or the battle-scarred victim. 
early on, there was a particular sort of guy that I seemed to keep meeting who, when he found out that I was in the Marine Corps, would ask me, like, oh, you ever shoot those big guns that could kill somebody from far away? And would want the exciting, aggressive stories. At a certain point, I realized that that kind of expectation had shifted, and what I tended to be getting in New York much more often was people assuming that I was broken. Many veterans say it's up to them to correct misperceptions, but still. But I do think over time it will be a problem in America if fewer and fewer people actually serve, and therefore a greater number of Americans have no connection, a real connection, emotional connection, an understanding, a deep understanding of, of what the servicemen and women do. So if he's right, then veterans will have a big job to do. As their numbers get smaller, their voices will have to become louder. David Botti, BBC News, Washington. And David's report is the last story on today's Outside Source. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.